In this video, we're going to go ahead and virtually assemble the air motor and determine all the different types of fits and why they're, they're there in this assembly. So we're going to first start off looking at the assembly drawing right here. And the assembly drawing shows us all the air motor parts in the exploded view that go together. So it takes 12 parts, 13 in total, in order to go ahead and manufacture an air motor. Well, six of them are parts we manufactured. The other, the other seven parts that are standard purchase parts that we purchased off McMastercard, or MSC, wherever we would get the best price. So that's going to be how the assembly of the air motor works. It takes 13 parts to go together. You're going to see from this exploded assembly view where every part goes in this air motor assembly. One of the first steps while well, assembling the air motor is to press fit the flywheel with the main shaft. So we're going to be looking at the hole sizes in the flywheel and the outside diameter of the shaft size of the main shaft in order to figure out their fits. If you remember, the allowance condition is when we calculate the fit at the maximum material condition. And that's the tightest fit these parts can ever have together. Now, the clearance condition is going to be the loosest part, the loosest fit these parts can ever have together. We calculate that at the least material condition. So when it comes to the material conditions, the main shaft, we look at the engineering drawing and we look for the largest outside diameter based off the tolerance, and it is blank. Then we take the smallest main shaft outside diameter, and this is blank. So that gives us the maximum and the least material condition for the main shaft. Now, in order to figure out their exact fits, I need to now look at the hole in the flywheel. So when I look at the engineering drawing on the flywheel, I see that the smallest size is actually the maximum material condition. So the smallest size based off the tolerance is, is blank. And then the largest size of the hole, the least material condition, is blank. Now that I've established these material conditions for both the shaft and the hole in the main shaft in the flywheel, I can go ahead and calculate the tightest fit that they'll have together. The tightest fit that they'll have together is calculated at MMC. Remember, and that's going to be known as the allowance calculation. So allowance is equal to the maximum material condition of the flywheel's hole minus the maximum material condition of the flywheel shaft, which I end up getting blank. Now, now that I got the tightest fit that they can have together, it's, it's nice to find out the loosest fit. That's going to be done with the clearance calculation. So clearance is calculated at least material condition. So the least material condition of the hole of the flywheel's hole minus the least material condition of the shaft. So the main shaft shafts least material condition. When I go ahead and I subtract the two, I get the clearance value of blank. Now I know that I have the tightest fit and the loosest fit in this press fit. Because both of these answers should have come out negative, I know that it's an interference fit. So the tightest value is the most interference that I'll have. The loosest value is the least amount of interference they have. Hence, both of the answers to these equations are negative values. So once I know that I've got, I've got this established now, the engineering side of it. I press fit it in by placing the shaft in the, in the fixture on the press. And then I line up the hole on the flywheel and I use the arbor press to go ahead and press the parts together. Now, once they're pressed together, this is a permanent way to attach things. You're going to see that the main shaft is now permanently attached to the flywheel. The next step in assembling the air motor is to press the hardened dowel pin into the machine crank disc. So the hardened dowel pin has been centerless ground to a tolerance of 2 tenths overall, 0 0.0002. So that means it's a quarter inch dowel pin, so it's minus 0 plus 2 tenths. That's the tolerance on the dowel pin. So I have to figure out the maximum and the least material condition. We know the least material condition is the smallest size because it's an external feature. So the least material condition is 0 0.2500. And the maximum material condition is 0.2502. So it's got the 2 tenths tolerance on, on one side on this dowel pin. 
Now, I found that information out by looking at the supplier that provides the dowel pins for us. They give you a tolerance value for the dowel pins. Now, next, I have to look at the engineering drawing for the crank disc, and I look at the largest size of the hole and the smallest size of the hole. Now, the smallest size of the hole is the maximum material condition. So the smallest size based off the engineering drawing in the lab manual is blank. And the largest size of the hole, which is the least material condition, is blank. Now that I have all the material condition values for the mating parts, I can calculate their fits. So the, remember, the allowance calculation calculates them at the maximum material condition. So the allowance for the crank disc versus the dowel pin is the crank disc's hole's MMC value minus the dowel pin's shaft's MMC value. I get a negative answer and I do the math here because that's going to be the tightest interference that they have. And because this is a press fit, they're going to have a negative answer for, from that equation. Next, I have to go ahead and calculate the loosest fit that they'll ever have. That's known as the clearance condition. So the clearance between the crank disc's hole and the dowel pin, I get that by taking the least material condition of the crank disc hole, which is blank, and I subtract that from the least material condition of the dowel pin, which was 0 0.2500. I end up getting a negative answer, and that's going to make sure ensure that both the allowance and clearance calculations are negative. I know that I've got a press fit between these two parts. But now I know my limits of my press fit thanks to the allowance and clearance calculations. Now that I've figured out how to do the math on the press fit, let's go ahead and press fit the dowel pin into the crank disc. To do this, I put the dowel pin in the fixture on the Arbor Press. Then I line up the pin with the hole. I have the chamfer side going in that helps start the hole. And I use the Arbor Press to press it in till it bottoms out in the, in the actual part. Then that's how we press fit pins into hole. So now I'm gonna show you how the air motor's assembled in SolidWorks and explain how we virtually assemble all the parts we machined, then we'll do it in real life. So the first step is to take the main shaft and flywheel assembly that we press fit together, and you slide the main shaft through the hole in the frame. Once that slides in all the way, we go ahead and we line up the crank disc with the, the flat on the crank disc for that D-shaped hole that we broached, and we go ahead and line that up with the main shaft flat. Now to secure them, we use that quarter 20 set screw. So we have to install the set screw and tighten it down on the main shaft. That locks this assembly into place on the frame. Our next step is gonna to be to take the piston and slide it up into the cylinder. We wanna make sure that the hole in the piston is showing through the slot in the piston so we can line that up with the crank, piston, the crank disc dowel pin. Once that's lined up, we bring the cylinder face to the mating face on the frame, and then we take the spring and the shoulder bolt and install them into that assembly and tighten down that, that 5 16 shoulder bolt. Next, we go ahead and we attach the frame to the wood base using the two wood screws, and we have a fully assembled air motor. Now I'm gonna go ahead and unassemble an assembled air motor, like I just described how to assemble it, and then reassemble it again to show you it in real life on the parts that we virtually machined last week in the lab. So here we go. Our first step is to go ahead and use our Phillips screwdriver to go ahead and take the air motor off of the wooden base. Then I go ahead and I use my Allen key to go ahead and loosen the shoulder bolt from the frame and the cylinder. Now be careful not to lose the spring if you're taking yours apart. At this point, I slide the cylinder and the piston off of the frame assembly and take the piston out of the cylinder. Now, in order to remove the crank disc from the main shaft, I have to use that, I have to loosen the set screw and that quarter 20 set screw, take that out and then slide the crank disc off the main shaft, off that flat that we machined to do it. Last, I go ahead and I 
remove the main shaft and flywheel assembly by pulling it out. Now to reverse it, just one more time, you slide it back in, the main shaft and the flywheel assembly, then you put the crank disc over the main shaft, tighten it up with a hex key, and at this point, we're going to slide the piston in, aligning it in, and then align the cylinder with the frame and insert the shoulder bolt into the assembly, tightening it first by hand so we don't strip it. And then in order to make sure it stays tight during operation, we go ahead and we tighten down the, the shoulder bolt to the frame. The last step is to mount it on the wooden base. So we align the, the holes in the frame with the holes in the wooden base. And we go ahead and we tighten the screws down using our Phillips screwdriver. At this point, we have fully assembled our air motor. Now, in order to make sure that our air motor runs, we have to go on to testing. In order to test the air motor, we have to have an air nozzle and compressed air. If you put the air nozzle in one side, the motor will run in one direction. If you put it in the other airport, it, re it runs in the reverse direction. So the motor, it has forward and reverse based on which port airport you put the air nozzle into. Now we first, we just stick the air nozzle into the air motor and we turn on the air and we see that the air motor assembly now runs. So this is how the air motor works. It takes air into one side of it and then it exhausts it out of the other port. And it runs in one direction if I choose to put air in the left port. If I go ahead and cho choose to apply air in the right port, it'll go ahead and run in the reverse direction. And that's how the Cal Poly air motor works.